Sex presents a problem, which cannot be evaded if one wishes to use its power for development toward the suprahuman. But the mere satisfaction of instinct retards development. Certain doctrines preach the use of sexual excitement as a means of awakening higher faculties and extraordinary powers. But such methods are really dangerous and should be shunned. What they evoke is not the higher faculties, but unhealthy forces from which it is then almost impossible to free oneself. This is one of the greatest perils a man can be involved in, for he becomes the slave of these powers and runs the risk of complete nervous and mental unbalance. On the other hand, the repression of the sexual instinct is equally a danger. Psychology has demonstrated that a passion violently thwarted is stifled rather than overcome. Conquest is only real when the adversary is disarmed by a more powerful expression of the vital force. So long as we exist in physical bodies, we are subject to nature's law of dualization, by which affinity is created between complementary opposites which are separated. This dualization, which is the foundation of nature and its basic evil, is also the foundation of terrestrial experience, the object of which is to transcend nature and return to union with the One. It is also the foundation of our cultivation of consciousness, since it gives us the possibility of choice between opposite qualities, between the real and the relative, between what is good or evil for us at the moment. This dualization, being the cause of affinity between complementary opposites, is the cause of sexuality and of the desire that men call love. The error is to confuse love, desire, and need. Need is an appetite and only concerns the physical body. Needs are therefore of the animal nature, the result of physiological functions stimulated at the appropriate point of the natural cycle. Desire, when aroused by need or instinct, is a purely animal impulse, but quite apart from animal impulses, desire can exist in man as an affinity for qualities or states of being of a more subtle sort. As a rule, however, we are not conscious of its deeper cause, and so we pervert the character of such a desire by confusing it with mere wishes or even needs and use it as an excuse for gratifying them, and thus the idea of love is vulgarized. Yet the idea of love, although applied to sexual desire, is a symbol of the absolute love, which has no single object, and which is the fruit of awareness of mutual solidarity. Sexual selection by affinity is a present manifestation of this cosmic love, the danger lies in confusing the origins of the various emotions of love, physical, sentimental, ideal, or even supposedly spiritual, for they have generally a sexual foundation, whether conscious or unconscious. For the relation of sex to the brain and liver is either forgotten or unknown. These three factors, the grand triad of the personality, affect one another so closely that it is often difficult to distinguish which of them is responsible for a sudden stirring of passion, desire, or thought. If one of them is overexcited or in abeyance, the other two are affected and produce feelings which the man, unaware of the interaction, takes seriously, not suspecting their physiological origin. Besides the sexual stirrings produced by the cycles of nature and human life, each individual is influenced by his own particular instincts, which make him react sexually to certain actions or circumstances. These instinctive characteristics are recorded in the liver, but produce reactions in the sex glands and the brain, and these two, being always in alliance, offer each other excuses for explaining and satisfying the resulting longings. The unawakened man is overtaken by these impulses and easily becomes their slave, spending his energy on them 
but not becoming enlightened. But he who wishes to escape from his animal nature will sincerely try to uncover his instincts and observe their working. He will, of course, lose the exciting effect of being taken by surprise, but he will gain in exchange the opportunity of using his instincts consciously to increase his vital fire. Instead of prostituting the idea of love by confusing it with the satisfaction of an instinct. Sexual energy has the same origin as the subtle fire which gives life. It is for man to use it wisely or else expend it thoughtlessly. He whose aim is satisfaction will refuse to learn control, preferring to be at the mercy of surprises and receive his pleasure without effort. But the man who has in him, even unconsciously, a sense of the true love, will be ashamed of animal sexuality, except in the service of perpetuating the species. This comes from his moral sense, the voice of conscience, which is our judge. Then the problem arises, what to do with the vital fire? Should one suffocate it, or can it be used to raise us to a higher life? To deny or suffocate sexual excitement is an act of suppression dictated by the will and results only too often in redirecting the energy into intellectual or sentimental imaginings with psychological trouble as a frequent consequence. Alternatively, continual suppression may lead to flaccidity, which is the way of death and not of life, for impotence is not the same as mastery. True mastery, without unfortunate consequences, is only attained when an inferior joy is replaced by a higher one. If slavery to sensual pleasure is an animal slavery, on the other hand, conscious desire is of the human realm. Indeed, it is the key to life and liberation once it is clarified, that is, stripped of artificial excuses. That desire, which is the key of life, seeks to increase the vital fire, and can be stirred or exalted either by sexual excitement or by the will to the light. Sexual excitement makes desire hypocritical if it has to excuse itself with aestheticism, sentimentality, and intellectual erotic imaginations. For all forms of eroticism are basically the search for emotional shock. And the cause of this emotional shock is an act which suddenly upsets the balance of our feelings. It violates our normal standard of feelings about morality, or about love and friendship, about reputation or security. Whether the shock is given by pain or joy or anguish, it is always a loss of balance which upsets our natural inertia. The shock is desired for excitement's sake, and if the aim of the excitement is sexual satisfaction, Nothing will be gained by the one sensual pleasure. A more conscious being, who looks for a higher joy, will desire the shock in order to strengthen his interior fire. In any case, therefore, to desire an emotional shock is to desire a loss of equilibrium. Any excess can do this, but erotic excess does it to increase the heat of sexual feeling. Erotic perversions are always a compensation for the tyranny of the ego. Masochism is inverted authoritarianism, and the wallowing in degradation is the inversion or mortification of sensual aestheticism. If their aim is only animal pleasure and satisfaction, erotic impulses can debase, but equally, if the intention is the opposite, they can serve like other emotional shocks to enhance consciousness and life. The difference lies in the aim and the mode of application. A man who risks his life for an impersonal cause may find an exaltation in the fear of danger because of the joy of sacrificing his purely selfish security. If you can choose at will either to yield deliberately to your animal nature without making excuses for it or else to control it and find in doing so the exaltation of sacrifice, then you have found one of the keys of life, the key to the transmutation of the vital fire. 
The joy of overcoming oneself transforms the desire for a fugitive pleasure into desire for the infinite joy. This cannot be too often repeated.